Tetracan Super Mono Block. This will be the first in a series of videos tearing down this Fostex 160 multi tracker. Exactly what the features are of this unit and how that compares with other uh, multi track cassette recorders will be the subject of another video, as will any specific problems I have with this after doing a general deconstruction, clean, and reassembly. Now, the purpose of this series of videos is to give you some sort of reconnaissance of how this is disassembled and how to access all the parts to do common service and repair tasks like cleaning, calibration, changing the belts, just to get access to printed circuit boards for soldering, signal tracing, this kind of thing. We'll begin by removing any of the knobs that we can from the front before opening the case to access the cassette player, the transport, because one of the most common things you'll have if you get your hands on a faulty one of these is that the rubber belts inside need to be replaced. These uh, fader caps, they all remove by hand. Probably need some sort of plastic implement to get it out, but this pitch control will come out as well. Uh, you can either pry it off here, I don't seem to be having a lot of success there, but just be wary that that's going to pop off when you finally open the case. These other controls, they fit from the back, and um, the coloured ones, um, so don't try and pull those. Whereas it is beneficial from a cleaning point of view to remove these, you don't actually need to remove these push push caps, so I'll probably be just leaving them on. With the unit flipped over onto its front on a soft surface, you're going to need to remove some screws from the back. The locations are one, two, three, four, five screws of this type around the edges. So wide ferrule, longish, black in colour, a sort of nippled cap. Then there's two indicated by these red pieces of tape. They're going to look something like this. Again, wide ferrule, but shorter, pointed tip. And uh, the head's uh, different, it doesn't have that double tier look to it. Here there's a hole for a screw. Now on this particular unit that screw was absent so I can't say exactly what was there. However I can tell you that it's going into a hole in the transport which is metal plate so it's narrow ferrule. It's going to be fairly long probably about that length and I can also see there's scratches on this metal plate that indicate that there was a star retainer for earth connection. So if you've got one of these and you're wondering where that long screw is, it's the only one of that type you're going to have from the exterior with the star connector goes then it's here. Getting this open is a matter of getting something to pry open one of these two holes here. In this case I'm using a pair of tweezers. So you get in there then it will hinge up from this side and then uh, this lip here goes into plastic recesses along that edge. So the board that you're looking at now is the record and playback amp. You can see it's labelled as R slash P amp here on the PCB. We're in the first instance working towards getting the cassette player out, the transport out, so that we can change the belts. But you can't actually remove the front panel without removing one, two, three, four screws that go through this PCB and through the chassis into the case below. I've tried to indicate those with arrows that I've drawn with Sharpie. So there's one here, there's another one here. Another one here. There's a fourth one here and you can see that it's going through an earth connection which is running from beside this large heat sink here and it's going through a lip that's coming from some shielding underneath. I'm just making you aware of that so you know where those things go on reassembly. So I'll just finish removing this. All of those screws are of that same type that we're going around the edges with the white tape markers. This will still be held in place lightly because it slots into plastic lips um, along this edge of the plastic case and then there's two little plastic clips here and um, two holes with pins that go through the holes in the PCB there that will keep it in place so you can turn it over without that falling out um, and at that point the front case will come off. Remember not to lose your pitch control wheel here if you didn't already remove that earlier in the process. So if we ignore the mixer section by and large for the moment and concentrate on getting this cassette player out, we're going to need to remove these meters and we're also going to need to remove the in-out PCB up here. These meters, they just sit on diagonal pairs of plastic pins. They're identical boards. There's not really any good annotation on the board of which do which. So um, the one that was on the right as you're facing the machine from this way, that's got a red plug, whereas the one that's on the left has a white plug. Just make sure that you don't, for instance, put them back that way 
with the red plugged one on the left or um, you'll confuse yourself when you're using the unit and um, you'll think that you're looking at the input levels on tracks one and two when you're actually seeing three and four and confuse yourself into thinking that the machine's not working. So those are pretty sturdy plugs, you can just pull those out by hand. This in out board is held down by two screws. Those are shortish wide ferrule ones. They're the same type that on the two quarters of the metal plate on the back. That will then lift to one side. We'll deal with um, which cables can be detached and how later on. There's a little metal plate that sits on top of the motor. That round lip goes underneath these wires here. I've opened one of these before and on that one there was another screw there. Seems to be missing on this one, but um, these two, which go through these plastic posts from the front, are narrow. You'll need a thinner Phillips head screwdriver like this one on the left. And then there's this one on the left, and there's a cable tie keeping all those uh, record playback head cables out of the way. So one of the things I commonly do is leave shorthand to myself on metal surfaces. So I'll put TH for thin screw here and put TH and C slash T for thin screw with a cable tie there. In addition to that, there's a screw that's very difficult to see right down here. This recess where my screwdriver's in there, I mean, I don't think it's visible, but that will need to be removed. There's another screw there. So if I just remove those and show you what that looks like. So it's just a little bit shorter, but otherwise very similar to the ones that were on the back. And I believe that in most cases you're going to find one here. Possibly the, a previous owner of this has already been in here and tried to change some belts and forgot to put two of the screws back in. Before we can tip this out, this little pitch control daughter board up here. There's a header on there. So a little bit tight for space. So I can just push that off with the flat head screwdriver. There we go. We can also see that two cables run in between these push push controls to two black sockets here leads to the transport. And finally, and I forgot to remove this earlier, there's this red and white cable. I guess that must be the 12 volt power coming out of a white header in here. That red header, black and white cable just passes through that hole. And then on this side of the transport, you can see that this long cable, it is easier to take all of these off to get the transport out. Just so you can pull that back and access this cable easier. Now let's see if there's anything else I've forgotten. Oh yeah, I forgot to, I pointed out that, but didn't actually undo it. Okay, so we just tip forward from the front. Got to be a little bit careful stringing through these magnetic head cables and then on this side I'll pass it through this hole. Maybe there's an argument for uh, changing all the belts and so on without completely detaching all those cables. Try it if you want. I tend to find that kind of thing is a false economy. You end up putting a lot of strain on the cables and then you have to repair them. And it's altogether easier to have the entire transport separate of everything else.